morning church would you join me in a word of prayer as we come together this morning to worship the lord our father he is worthy to be praised he is worthy of our worship this week has been a blessed week did everything go your way this week probably not uh, but god is still faithful god is still amazing god is still the god of our salvation would you get your mind right this morning to receive and to hear the word of the Lord? Would you get your mind and your heart right this morning to worship God, to clap your hands, and to tell God, thank you. There's nobody in this church house, there's nobody streaming, there's nobody on this phone, there's nobody on social media that can give God praise for what he's done for you. Only you know what he's done for you. He woke you up this morning. He started you on your way this morning. He put food in your tummy this morning. You have a roof over your head. Is there drama in your life? Absolutely. But is God greater than that? Oh, yeah. And because of that, we worship him this morning. Would you bow your heads with me? Would you close your eyes? And would you begin to talk to your father, blessing him, thanking him for what he's done for you? Hallelujah. This is a sweet hour of prayer. You don't need a whole lot of people to praise God. You don't need a whole lot of shouting to tell God thank you. You don't need the drums or the organ to be blaring to tell God I appreciate you. Even if he does nothing else for you, he's good. Come on, church, talk to your father this morning. Hallelujah. Thank you, Jesus. Thank you, Jesus. Father, we bless your name this morning. You are the God of our salvation. And as David said, whom shall I fear? You are the strength of our lives. In whom shall I be afraid? Father, because of who you are, because of your greatness, because of your amazing grace, we lift our hands and tell you thank you. We lift our voices and we shout hallelujah. We praise your name because of your great, your great, your great, your greatness that has been bestowed upon us. You've blessed us to see this day, a day that we have not seen before. You blessed us, Father, to get through this entire week in one piece. The enemy tried, he tried to distract us, but it was your angels who were camped itself all around us and protected us from dangers seen and unseen. And because of that, Lord, we say, Father, we bless your name for this wondrous day. We bless your name because you're faithful beyond measure. Father, as we come together to worship your name, we pray that your spirit fall down on us. We pray that your spirit fills us. We pray that we set aside form and fashion and just enter into true worship. We pray that our mouths speak, that our hands clap, that our feet stomp that our hands wave, that we can do anything we can to let you know we honor you and we lift you up this morning. Father, would you speak to us through the word? Would you let your word manifest in our hearts and our minds? May we have open hearts, open ears, open minds to receive what you have for us this morning. And we pray these blessings in Jesus' name. Amen. As we transition into worship, don't you stop praying. Don't you stop praying. Just because we got a to-do list and an agenda doesn't mean worship stops. Worship interrupts the agenda. Don't stop praying. You got a child. You got a spouse. You got a family member that's on your mind. Don't you stop petitioning God. This is the place of love and prayer. 
I triple dare you to take full advantage of it. I told you last week, this entire house is an altar. As we worship in song and the reading of his word, don't you stop. Don't you stop. Let's go before our Father. Let's meditate on His goodness. Hallelujah. He has been good to us. He's been more than good to us. He is an amazing Father, the creator of everything. We've come to worship Him. We could have easily found something to do this morning with all the tasks that we have before us, but we took time to come in and worship the one and only true God the master of everything. Let's concentrate on him. Let's dedicate our hearts, our minds for these next few hours on our God, on our savior, for what he's done for us, for where he's brought us from, the miracles he's operated in our lives. Let's just worship him. He is worthy. He's worthy not because I say so. He's worthy because he is. He's done awesome things in our lives, and each of us know what he's done and how awesome he is. Say, thank you, Jesus. Oh, glory. He's too good to us. We're not worthy of what he's done. We have to give him all the honor, and we come to dedicate our lives to him not just for this moment, but forever. He died once and for all so that we may be saved. Hallelujah. Thank you. Hallelujah. Thank you, Father. Thank you for your goodness. Thank you for your faithfulness. Thank you for all that you've done. Thank you. You are worthy, Father. You are worthy. Let's ask God into our hearts. Father, purify us. We know we've done what is not right before you. We ask you to purify our hearts that we may be holy before you, God. And that the praise and worship we've come to give you this morning shall be a sweet odor before you. Purify our mouths, but we've been saying things we shouldn't say. Purify our eyes, we've been watching things we shouldn't watch. Our ears have been listening to things we should not be listening to, Father. Thinking on things with our minds that we should not be thinking, Father. We ask you to purify us with the only blood that is able to purify all things out of us, King of Kings. No matter how crimson we are, Lord, you make us white as snow white as snow you said you removed our sins as far as the east is from the west god we thank you even when our neighborhoods have committed to us that we're somebody and we'll never change you said we're a new creation even when our parents had spoken bad about us and said we would never be anything god you gave us a new identity and we come to say thank you jesus we thank you for the blood that was shed on Calvary, Lord. We thank you because you didn't have to do it, but you did. You weren't worthy, oh God. You didn't deserve that kind of death, but you took it for me. You died for me, God. In this season, as we recognize your resurrection, God, we can't go past your death. We can't go past the suffering you took on our behalf. We can't go past the stripes that you took on our behalf. We can't go past, Heavenly Father, the ways they treated you, spat on you, put a crown of thorns on your head for me, for us. God, we come to worship you because you are good, you are amazing, you are awesome, you are love itself, and we come to say we love you too, Father. We love you too, Father. This morning, make us a new creation. Give us a new mind. Give us a new way of pattern of speaking. 
remove the things, anger, the contention in our hearts, remove the strife, the anger that continuing we're holding against our brothers and sisters. Let it go, Lord. Help us to let it go. Because we want you more than anything. This morning, receive our worship. That every soul that enters this space may feel your presence will never be the same again. That our lives, Father God, will never be the same again. That our families will never be the same again. Our jobs, our finances will never be the same again. That our health will never be the same again in the name of Jesus. We receive what you have for us in the mighty name of Jesus, we pray. Just thank him. We're going to give him thanks. We're going to worship him this morning. We're going to let go of all the things that are chaining us, all the things that are making us feel boggled down. We're going to worship him this morning. Oh, give thanks unto the Lord, for he is good. Yes, he is good. Hallelujah.
Hallelujah. Praise the Lord. Let's open our Bibles together for the glory of God as we stand to our feet to read Psalms 42. Psalms 42 for the glory of God. He is worthy. He is worthy. He is worthy. Psalms 42. Let this be our prayer this morning. As the heart panteth after the water brooks, so panteth my soul after thee, O God. My soul thirsteth for God, for the living God. When shall I come and appear before God? My tears have been my meat day and night, while they continually say to me, Where is thy God? When I remember these things, I pour out my soul in me, for I had gone with the multitude. I went with them to the house of God with the voice of joy and praise, with a multitude that kept holy day. Why art thou cast down, O my soul? And why art thou disquieted in me? Hope thou in God, for I shall yet praise him for the help of his countenance. O my God, my soul is cast down within me. Therefore will I remember thee from the land of Jordan and the Hermonites from the hill of Miser. Deep called unto deep at the noise of thy water spouts. All thy waves and thy billows are gone over me. Yet the Lord will command his loving kindness in the daytime. And in the night his song shall be with me. And my prayer unto the God of my life. So on um, verse 9. I will say unto God, my rock, why hast thou forgotten me? Why go I mourning because of the oppression of the enemy? As with a sword in my bones, and my enemy reproach me, while they say daily unto me, Where is thy God? Why art thou cast down, O my soul, and why art thou disquieted within me? Hope thou in God, for I shall yet praise him, who is the health of my countenance, and my God. Amen. Amen. Praise God. I will bless the Lord. You may be seated in the presence of the Lord. Hallelujah. He is worthy. We're going to continue to worship him together. That's what we came to do this morning is worship our God. Just see you and him. Just focus on yourself and your Savior. For what he's done for you alone. Hallelujah. Know what he's done for you. So we're going to praise him and worship him together in the name of Jesus. With my hands lifted up. With my hands lifted up.
you, Lord. You are worthy. You are worthy. You are worthy, God. You are worthy. You are awesome. How did that get? You are worthy, Jesus. You are worthy. I will bless you. I will honor you. I will worship you. I will glorify you. I am yours. Hallelujah. 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 Heavenly Father, we glorify you this morning. Thank you for who you are. Thank you for your majesty. Thank you for your power. Hallelujah. You are amazing, Father. There is no one like you. And Lord, we've tried to find one like you. We've sought, we've looked up, we've looked below, we've looked left, we've looked right, trying to find something, someone that can compare to you. And we can't find not one. You are amazing. We stand in awe of you this morning, of all the things you've done, for the things you've done in our lives, God. Where would we be if it had not been for you? For our families, you've comforted, you've strengthened, you've delivered us from the hands of the enemy. God, you've transformed our minds when we thought we would be somewhere in an asylum. You gave us a right mind. You healed our bodies, God, when we were ill, when the enemy had said it was over, you said dot, 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 and you continued the situation and you continued our lives. We thank you, God, for being all that we ever needed. We thank you for being the savior of our souls. We thank you for being the restorer of our relationships. We thank you for being the builder up of our families. We thank you for being the lawyer in the courtroom. We thank you for being the surgeon in the operating room. We thank you, God, for blessing us upon the many, many trials and tribulations that we faced. You have been good to us. We can't say anything else, Lord, but thank you. This morning, we just come to show you our gratefulness. We come to say thank you for all the many, many ways you've touched our children. You protected them from harm and danger. You shielded them, Father God, as a kernel in a glass bottle. The enemy may try to peck at it, but they will never get it. You've protected our children the same way. Father, we exalt you. We worship you. We thank you, oh God, for being the miracle worker. We thank you, God, for opening up our eyes and removing the veil, for helping us to see that, Lord, we were kicking against the pricks, that we were doing things, Father God, to hurt ourselves, that we were making a pathway to hell. And, Lord, you stopped us in our tracks and gave us salvation. This morning, we come to exalt you. We come to ponder on the things that you've done for us, God. We can sit right now and start seeing flashes of all the miracles you've operated, flashes of all the ways you've made out of no way. When we thought our bank account was negative, Lord, you deposited something in it. When we thought we wouldn't be able to get that job, you opened the door for us, Lord. When we thought our child wouldn't be able to get into that school, you opened the door for us, God. You've made ways out of no way. And we come to say thank you. We come to say thank you for providing for us, oh Lord, when we didn't know where our next meal was coming from. You made ways for us, oh God, and multiply the little bit we had so that we can feed the whole family. We come to say thank you. We come to say thank you for the ways you've allowed us to be able to learn and grow and develop. There was a season and a time where we could not learn. We were not allowed to go to school. We were not allowed to read, but today we can and we thank you. We thank you, God, for the rights you've given us and the ways and privileges, even though though things may not be perfect. But, Lord, we thank you for the ways you've made, the strives you've made for us, the ways you defeated the enemy so that we can have meaning and and, and able to have definition and identity in you. We ask in the name of Jesus that you may sanctify us, that we may be pure. There is not just about us receiving all these benefits, but may be sanctified to serve and worship you and be lights in the realms that you've called us to in the name of Jesus. Help us not to be stingy with the word. Help us not to be stingy with the gospel. Help us not to be stingy with your goodness and to share with everyone around us. That, Father God, they may too taste and see that you are good. This morning, as we think about what you've done, as we see those images you remind us of how many times the enemy has lost 
Our testimony is a reminder to the enemy that he's, de he's been defeated. Every time you open a door for us, God, it is a testimony and a reminder to the enemy that he's lost the battle. And we thank you for victory. We thank you for victory in our family. We thank you for victory in our church. We thank you for victory in our neighborhood. We thank you for victory, uh, oh Lord, in the school system. We thank you for victory in the health system. We thank you for victory in the correctional system right now, that your Holy Spirit may take over, that you may, oh Lord, arm your soldiers all around this world. Starting from here, Lord God, show us how to operate in your light, operate in your holiness, operate from your word, and be a light that brightly shines, that others may know you. God, thank you for so much. Thank you for so much that you've done, and we shall honor you forevermore. We can't stop but say thank you. Hear us, oh God, and receive us today in our worship. Let's take some time as we think about what God has done. In your own words, speak to your Father. In your own words, speak to your Father. Thank him for what he's done. Acknowledge him. Let the words of my mouth, the meditation of my heart, be acceptable in thy sight. O Lord, my strength and my redeemer. Thank you for all that you've done. Lord. Don't get distracted. Think of what he's done. Think of what he's done. Think of what he's done. Think of what he's done where he's brought us from and we didn't deserve it hallelujah thank you father amazing grace hallelujah his amazing grace is what keeps us here this morning and we're going to sing this song to give him glory. It's his amazing grace. Hallelujah. And we want to worship him.
Lord. Hallelujah. We worship you, God. Thank you for all the amazing grace. We exalt you. Hallelujah. Hallelujah. Thank you, Father. You may be seated in the presence of the Lord, and we're going to welcome our pastor as he welcomes the visitors this morning. How many of you are thankful for amazing grace? Y'all are quiet church today. How many of y'all thankful for amazing grace? It is that amazing grace that has brought us this far, and it's that amazing grace that will take us home. I'm not talking about your address. I'm talking about the home over yonder. You know the place you hope to get into? The, the, the streets of paved with gold, right? The pearly gates, that, that home. It is his amazing grace that will allow us to get there. Now, as we continue our worship this morning, we want to do pause for a moment and recognize our visitors. Are there any visitors in the house? Uh, you might as well go ahead and stand. We're looking at you. <laughs> hey, Sister Robin. And I believe mostly everybody knows you in this house. Welcome back. Absolutely. Praise God. Can we... Uh, can we give her a second Baptist welcome? Oh, Lisa, you wanna? Oh yeah, let's recognize Lisa Johnson as a visitor. Absolutely. <laughs> Don't be shy. Praise God, amen. And uh, the guy next to her. Before we uh, jump into the, the song, you want the mic this time? All right. Uh, we want to recognize one more person. This person is not a visitor, uh, but she is a member and a friend of Living Faith and now part of our family, Tamika Asbury. Let's recognize Tamika. <laughs> but because this is your first time here, you're going to get this second bath, this smoke. So, uh, Sister Johnson, you want to kick us off? Here today at Second Baptist Church, you're welcome, each and every one of you. Welcome here in Jesus' name. Amen. John, I don't say Pastor Johnson because I say Pastor Luz. <laughs> and then I also am grateful to see Sister Tamika. So I'm so happy to see everyone here this morning. Praise God. We're going to sing all the glory and honor um, through the song, Leaning on His Everlasting Arms. How many people know that one this morning? Praise God. I would love you to stand up. I gave you a little bit of break this morning. I think last time I hurt you a little bit. So I'm gonna give you, I gave you a good break. We're going to stand up and praise God this morning. <laughs>
comes. Hallelujah. Hallelujah. You don't have to fear. You don't have to fear. You're leaning. Hallelujah. You're anchored. You're anchored. Hallelujah. Thank you for the everlasting arms. Thank you for the everlasting arm. Thank you for the everlasting arm. Hallelujah. 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 Thank you, Lord. Thank you, Lord. Thank you, Lord. For the everlasting arm. It never gets weak. It never tires out. Hallelujah. The everlasting arm. Hallelujah. We're leaning. We're leaning. Somebody thought you were tripping. Somebody thought you were just limping. But you're leaning on the everlasting arms. You're leaning on God. Hallelujah. You have nothing to fear. Hallelujah. 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 Not everybody can lean. Only when you feel comfortable, you can lean. We're leaning. We're leaning. We trust him. He got us. We have nothing to worry about. We're leaning on his everlasting arms. Hallelujah. May his grace. Hallelujah. May his love. May his comfort guide you. May his word. May his Holy Spirit be a buckler. Hallelujah. Throughout this week, lean on the everlasting arms. Hallelujah. When the trials come, lean on the everlasting arm. He is worthy to be praised. Hallelujah. 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 Thank you, Jesus. Glory, glory. Hallelujah. Praise him. Don't y'all stop worshiping. Don't y'all stop worshiping. Don't you stop worshiping. Hallelujah. 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 We're leaning on his arms. Hallelujah. Father, we come today with our hearts open and our minds open to receive what you have for us. Lord, will you speak today? Lord, would you articulate your word today to us? Would you make clear what you want us to hear today? May we be responsive to what you're calling us to do, where you're calling us to go, what you're calling us to say. Father, would you speak now in Jesus' name? Would you take, all out, take out what that offends? Would you remove what's standing in the way of us hearing what you have to say today? The distractions, Father, we rebuke it now in Jesus' name. The hurt feelings, we rebuke it now in Jesus' name. We need your word to live. We need your word to heal. And we pray these blessings in Jesus' name. Amen. In this house, we stand for the reading of the word of the Lord. Hallelujah. We stand for the reading of the word of the Lord. We honor God's word in this house. This is God's house. Amen. Y'all didn't say that loud enough for me. This is God's house. Amen. This is not my house. This is not the car house. This is not even second bath. This is God's house. And so we stand in reading of God's word. Please turn your attention to James chapter 2. James chapter 2 verses 17 to 18. We praise God for the sacredness of his word. James chapter 2, verses 17 to 18. <clears throat> Amen. James 2, 17 to 18. I'm going to go old school for a minute. When you have it, say amen. amen. All right. It says also, I'm reading this in the uh, ESV version. It says also, faith by itself, if it does not have works... Just, just tap your neighbor and say, your faith is dead, bro. <laughs> sis, you're dead. Your faith is dead, sis. Because your faith is dead. 
If it does not have works, it is dead. But someone will say, you have faith and I have works. Show me your faith apart from your works, and I will show you my faith by my works. You may have your seats in God's house today. Uh, touch your neighbor, or if you don't feel like passing cooties, just look at your neighbor. <laughs> Amen, somebody. Look at your neighbor and tell them, I'm about to tell you. Now, we got to do this on unison. Come on, y'all. I'm about to tell you the profile of an isolationist. Ooh. <laughs> the profile of an isolationist. Uh, for those that are not aware, uh, let me educate you just, just for a little bit. Uh, an isolationist uh, is a person who favors uh, policies uh, that highlights remaining apart from the affairs and interests of other groups. Uh, this is particularly true uh, in political affairs and as it relates to other countries. This can be true even in the same country where you have states who prefer not to do business uh, with other states. Uh, they prefer to remain isolated or alone. An isolationist uh, is fundamentally an advocate for neutral neutrality and opposes entanglements. Uh, they oppose confrontations, particularly from a military sense. Uh, they won't buy into a military alliance uh, they don't buy into mutual defenses. Uh, when I was growing up in Philadelphia, if you messed with my brother, that means you, you messed with me. Uh, you messed with my best friend, then we all jumping in. This, this is not a one-on-one -on -one fight. So when I was growing up, it was, it was a team effort. It was a team sport. An isolationist says that that's not my problem. An isolationist says, uh, you gotta fix that since you created that. Uh, in its purest form, in its purest form, isolationism opposes all commitments. In its purest form, when you melt it down to its core, an isolationist opposes commitments. They oppose commitments to others unless it is self-serving. Now, you may be asking yourself, preacher, uh, does the Bible speak of this? I'm happy to share with you, if you were asking that question, it does speak of this particular topic in great detail. One such scripture can be found in Proverbs chapter 18, verse 1. doesn't matter which version of the Bible you read it in, but I need you to hear what God says about this topic of isolationism. Proverbs chapter 18, verse 1. It says, whoever isolates himself seeks out his own desire. He or she breaks out against all sound judgment. This is a self-explanatory scripture, but how many of you all know in this room a person who always isolates themselves? The moment things don't go their way, they isolate themselves. Uh, when things don't turn out the way that they planned, we used to say they take their ball and they go home. Do y'all know anybody like that? Uh, perhaps you have that isolationist spirit that you seem to find value and comfort in isolating yourself when you're not happy. Uh, you separate yourself from others. Uh, you divide yourself from the group. You used to be a part of something, but now you sever ties. Even if it's temporarily or uh, this can be done because of discomfort. I'm not happy. Therefore, when I separate myself or I divorce myself from what is the norm, I begin to seek out the things that make me feel good. The interpretation of this and another way of looking at this is when you seek out what you want after isolating yourself, it is a form of worship. It is a form of prayer. In other words, it is a form of idolatry. When you isolate yourself, you engage in idolatrous behavior. You begin to worship, as Romans 1 says, the creation instead of the creator.
when you decide to divide yourself, you worry about only one person. You begin to seek pleasure for an audience of one. And you tend to ignore the greater power that is God. And this becomes problematic because according to Proverbs 18.1, when you do this, you break out, you stand against sound judgment. You won't even hear common sense anymore. People can't even talk you off the ledge anymore. Because you're in a position and in a place where I want to do what I want to do. And no amount of sense is going to take me off of this path. Again, I ask you, how many of you know somebody who has done this before? They've performed a disappearing act. You see them every day, but they're, they're gone. They are emotionally disconnected and isolated. They're mentally disconnected and isolated. They're spiritually disconnected and isolated. You can show them facts. You can show them proof. You can give them evidence. And they will still isolate themselves from the truth. I've asked you, and this is the third time I've asked you, how many people know someone like that? But let's get a little personal. How many of us have been there, done that, got the t-shirt and the headband? This is the profile of an isolationist. There are, watch this, way too many Christians not have function in this way. There are way too many Christians who function as isolationists in their faith. They function as if they can move mountains. They function as if they can call out healing and rid themselves and others of disease. They function as if they can acquire resources, money to live a comfortable life. And yes, they think they can blink their way into a blessing or an open door. In other words, Christians that live in isolationist behavior or have isolationist attitudes in their faith, they do this by way of speaking. They constantly talk. They always have something to say. Something is always coming out of their mouth. They speak mountains into the sea. They're quoting scriptures. I'm blessed and I'm highly favored. Uh, I'll call down blessings from heaven like the old prophets used to, and I'll solve my problems. If I'm sick, I ignore the doctor's report and I'll claim my own healing. I'll call out devils if I have to. However, unfortunately, let me share this with you. These isolationists, these people, these Christians, sometimes us, we lack an awareness of how our faith really looks. And it doesn't look too good. When you have an isolationist approach to your faith, your faith is devoid of depth. Your faith ain't deep. I need y'all to hear me today. It looks deep, but your faith really ain't deep. It sounds deep, but it's destitute of vibrancy. Your faith sounds good, but your faith is not contagious. You're the only one that believes the foolishness that's coming out of your mouth. Your faith sounds good, but it's bankrupt, and it lacks value. This hour that we're in as a church, we must now come to the place to denounce the isolationist view of our faith. Because what we've been speaking and what we've been doing ain't working. I hope y'all hear me today. It's not working. In this house, I told you last week, this house will be a house of living, acting faith. 
It's a house of love, and it's a house of prayer. This does suggest that what we've been doing hasn't been enough. Based upon the prayers I've heard, the prayer requests that I've heard, based upon the things y'all have said to me, you need stronger faith to have God move on your behalf. A new pastor is not going to rain down blessings on you. I'm not over. I can't hand out blessings like it's a piece of candy. You need faith for that. I want to help you today break out of your isolationist mindset relative to your faith. I want to teach you today how to have active faith, real faith, living faith, faith that can truly move mountains. I want to teach you today how to truly have faith that is deep. That when you call something, you know without a shadow of a doubt, it's going to happen. Join me in James chapter 2. James chapter 2, verse 17 and 18. We're going to read and study today from the ESV version of the Bible. Again, this is what it says. So faith uh, by itself, it does not, if it does not have works, is dead. But Someone will say, you have faith and I have works. They try to separate them. And he says in his B clause of 18, show me your faith apart from your works and I will show you my faith by my works. So faith, James 2.17, so faith. Everybody has faith. How do you know? Faith is simply defined as a conviction. It's an idea. It's a, a firmly held belief typically associated with our religious practices, religious truths according to the word of God for this church and the truthfulness of God. Faith is a constancy in your profession of an idea, of a truth, of a concept that is consistent no matter who says it. Faith is nothing but a belief system. I can say with confidence that everybody in this house, everybody who's watching, everybody who's listening on the stream, we all got some version of faith. We practice faith. We believe faith. We articulate faith in all aspects of our lives. Faith is intertwined in our religious life and in our secular life. We all go to work. Those of us that work, we work our two weeks and we don't even think about whether or not we're going to get paid at the end of the two weeks. We just wake up Friday morning and we believe that the check will be there. For those of you that are blessed to be retired, you don't think about the 1st and the 15th. You just know I'm going to check the account and it's there. You function in faith because of your conviction of ideas, your conviction of truth, your conviction of information that has been proven to you. But there's a problem if that's all you have. There's a lot of people that can say, I have faith in you, but don't prove it at any point. I believe in you, but they don't actually show it. It's just words. And so the writer today says, so faith, the conviction, our ideals, our concepts, by itself is not enough. If that's all you have, then you're standing on an island of self and your faith is isolated. If your faith is all you have, if that's the only thing you're standing on, if your faith does not have any information or work behind it, itself, it is broken. It's broken. Your faith cannot merely be words. It must be action. It must be work behind it. It must be some sort of labor, some sort of deed that follows behind what comes out of your mouth. Don't tell me you love me and don't answer the phone when I call. Don't tell me you have my back, but when I need a dollar, I don't, I don't got it. I don't got it, dog. Can, can you come back and, and, and come back another day? Don't tell me you're my friend and I'm hungry and you can't get me something off the dollar menu. Are, are you serious right now? Faith by way of your mouth is not enough. Many of us communicate our faith during times when things are going our way. I love you. I got your back. I'll never let you down right after we've just been pleased by the other person. But when push comes to shove, we are nowhere to be found. Have you ever been let down by somebody who claimed 
that they loved you, but they didn't prove it? Have you been let down by a job that claimed that they wanted you, but they didn't hire you? Have you pursued something, a contract or a business opportunity, and the client said you got the job, but they never followed through with it? Have you ever been let down by a situation? It's just words. Until I see the fruit of what you're saying, it's just words. This is what isolationist faith looks like. It's words. We've come to church all these years speaking words, reciting words, reciting song lyrics, reciting church catchphrases, and we think we're expressing faith. I'm sorry to tell you, that's not true faith. I'm sorry if I'm busting your bubble, but God is requiring something great of you and I. He wants higher faith. He wants deeper faith. So he says that faith by itself, if it does not have works behind it, your faith is dead. You want to know why people can look at you and know that they know that you don't believe what you're saying? They're looking at your fruit or the lack thereof. They know you don't believe what you're saying because they can see by your evidence that you're not going to follow through. In fact, you haven't even started. You know that cousin at the barbecue who always giving you an update about their life and how great things are and what they finna do and what they about to do? And you know good and well they ain't about to do nothing. Why? Because there's no evidence. It's just talk. Then the writer takes us to verse 18. He says, but someone will say, you got people in your life who will say this stuff. They will separate faith and works. He says, you have faith and I have works. See, I got the most important thing. I got faith. I believe tomorrow I'm going to wake up a millionaire. I believe my bills will be paid and I'll be debt free tomorrow. I truly believe that. I, I, I believe I'm going to hit the numbers just right. <laughs> and I'm going to give this large tithe to the church. I just simply believe and it's going to happen. Folks who have isolationist faith, they separate faith and action. Be cautious of these individuals who always have something to say, but don't do nothing. Be cautious of individuals who have something to say and don't do anything to support their works. So the writer gives us this wisdom here on the backside of verse 18. He says, you show me your faith apart, separate isolated from works and I'm going to do you one better I'm going to show you my faith by my works your faith is only proven by the toil of your hands by the effort of your feet by the labor of your body by the deeds that you do if you don't have any action behind what you do your faith is void it is dead this matters a lot because your actions speak louder than your words could ever do. The writer is introducing to us, maybe introducing to some of you for the first time and affirming for others that if you're going to prove your faith, you got to show your faith by your actions because your actions, they emanate faith. They, they project out faith. They humanize faith. It highlights faith. Your works is the means by which your faith is able to show up for real. The days of talking and talking about what I'm about to do, what I'm getting ready to do, what had happened, those days are over. The days of believing that the pastor can pray blessings down from heaven, those days are over. The days of begging God for one more opportunity, one more miracle, those days are over because if you truly believe, your faith will be manifested by the actions that you take. As I close this sermon today, I need you to understand that the call today, the clarion call today is to get out of isolationism. The call today is to get your faith off that island because it ain't working. 
touch your brother, touch your sister, say it ain't working. I know we tried it before, but it just ain't working. I know we keep talking about it, but it just ain't working. We got a text messaging group. It ain't working, y'all. It's not being fixed. You can post on social media all you want to about what's going to happen, what you're going to do, but it ain't working. We need action. I got three points for you to help you close the deal today about how to strengthen your faith and how to get off that island. Number one, you must be governed by convictions. Yes, you need faith. Yes, you need a foundation of beliefs. Yes, you need some information to guide you. You cannot take action based upon faulty information. You must strengthen your faith by solid information, by solid beliefs, by solid convictions. If you don't believe this gospel, it is difficult, if not impossible, to live out this faith on a day-to-day -day basis. You must be governed by your faith and your convictions. You must believe that they exist. You must believe that they have purpose. You must believe that they are real. Second thing in this close is that you must live out your faith and your convictions. It's not enough to say, I believe this. It's not enough to say, I believe that. But you, my brother, my sister, you must live out this thing. This must be a part of your philosophy of life. Everything that I do, everything that I say, every place that I go, I am living out my convictions. This means the time of hypocrisy, it's over. The time where you can say, I do something, but you do something else, those days are over. You say one thing, you go another place, those days are over. Either you in or you're out. Either you're hot or you're cold. Just pick a side. I'm going to live out my faith. It doesn't matter how much blowback I get from my family and my friends. I want to show up and be consistent. I want people to know who I am. But people can't tell when you say something and you do something different. Live out your faith and your convictions. Live out your faith and your convictions. Take action according to your faith and your convictions. Don't just believe but do. Do it. Do it. I believe God for healing. Cool. Do it. I believe God for breakthrough. Awesome sauce. Do it. I believe God for a breakthrough. Great. Do it. I believe God's going to heal my marriage. That's awesome. Do it. I believe he's going to save my children. That's great. Do it. I believe he's going to save my community. Amazing grace. Cool. Do it. I believe he's going to bless this church. I believe it too. Do it. Where's the evidence? Where's the proof? Where's the proof of your belief? Where's the proof of your convictions? I believe God and I'm going to prove God by being a willing vessel. A sacrifice that's alive and real that God can use. I'm willing to become God's battle axe and his weapon of war. I believe. Awesome. Do it. Do it. This week, as you live out this word this week, just remind yourself, do it. Do it. I talk a lot. Yeah, stop talking. Just do it. When you get to the job tomorrow, just, just, just do it. You expect your staff to do it. You expect your children to do it. You expect your family to do it. Stop talking and just do it. Here's my last point in this close. Number one, we know that we got to be governed by our faith and our convictions. Number two, we got to simply live out our faith and our convictions. We got to just simply do it. Here's my third point. We got to follow the methodology of Jesus' faith. We got to follow the methodology of Jesus' faith. When Jesus said simply these words at the end of his time, he says, Nevertheless, not my will, but thine will be done. In the gospel according to Luke 22 and 42, he recites these words before he was arrested. He was quoted at saying these words at a time where he thought his friends were going to be there with him. He invited them to come to the garden to pray with him, and he asked them just to wait a little while. He went back three times, and each time he went back, his friends were asleep. Uh, they couldn't hang with Jesus. Uh, they couldn't hang and keep their eyes open. Uh, they were overwhelmed by grief. They were overwhelmed by tiredness. And quite frankly, Jesus' problem 
wasn't their problem. When people fall asleep on you, they're proving that they have isolationist beliefs of you. But when you're by yourself, I need you to know that you're truly not by yourself. Jesus, every time he went back, can you just wait a little while with me? Just a few minutes. He went back three times to no success. And then he kept praying and the Bible says that his sweat looked like blood coming down his face. And it was at this important time Jesus looked up to heaven and quoted the most important words of his ministry. He said, Father, nevertheless, not my will, nevertheless, not my desire, nevertheless, not my wants, nevertheless, not my will, not my will, not my interest, but thy will be done. These words are words that he recited to show his submission to a greater power. These words, you guessed it, are proof of his faith. These words are his convictions. These words are the foundation of his firmly held beliefs. Even when he left the throne, he said, Father, you need a holy lamb of God who can die, who can take on the sins of the world. And I believe, Father, that you've called me to do this. It's come time now. It's been 33 and a half years, and he recites these faithful words. Nevertheless, not my will, but thine will be done. He had a conviction with these words. His conviction was, I must live among them. In order for me to understand their pain and their discomfort and to understand temptation, I must live among them. He was convinced that he must understand us. He was convinced that he needed to understand our mindsets, our emotional status, and where we were coming from. He was convinced that he had to preach to us. And certainly did he preach to the hearts of God's people. He was convinced as a part of his faith that he had to serve us, that he had to heal us, that he had to revive us. But those words are just words until he started doing it. Not my will, but thine will be done. He didn't just believe he had to live among us, he did. He didn't believe he just had to understand us, he did referenced the woman at the well he understood her referenced the woman caught in adultery he understood her referenced the man who was at the pool of bethesda for 38 years he understood him he spent the time to understand he didn't just believe that he had to preach to us he gave us the beatitudes he gave us the gospels and he preached he didn't just believe he had to serve he served he healed he delivered he revived his words, nevertheless, not my will, but thine will be done. They weren't isolated words. Those words were followed up by an arrest and a false accusation. Those words, nevertheless, my, not my will, but thine will be done. They were followed up by a false trial where he was accused of blaspheme. And they whipped him until he started bleeding. Nevertheless, not my will, but thine will be done. They were not isolated words. He followed it up by wearing a crown of thorns on his head. Nevertheless, not my will, but thine will be done. Those words didn't sit. He carried his cross to Calvary. Nevertheless, not my will, but thine will be done. He got on that cross and they nailed his hands and they nailed his feet. Nevertheless, not my will, but thine will be done. They pierced him in his side. Nevertheless, not my will, but thy will be done. They didn't just stand. Those words weren't it. They spat on him. They gambled his clothes away. They talked about him. They tried to tempt him to get off the cross. Nevertheless, 
Nevertheless, not my will, but thy will be done. Those words weren't alone. He followed up and said, I'm giving up the ghost. He died for you and I. He proved his faith and his conviction. He proved he believed in God's will. He proved he believed in God's purpose because he died for you and I. Nevertheless, not my will, but thy will be done. It wasn't over. The arrest wasn't the only thing. The false accusations weren't the only thing. The crown of thorns weren't it. The beating wasn't the end of the road for him. The stabbing wasn't the end of the road for him. The accusations weren't the end of the road for him. The gambling wasn't the end of the road for him. Nevertheless, I need to prove his will. That God is God. And he's God over all. Including death, hell, and the grave. Nevertheless, I can't stay asleep. Nevertheless, they ain't going to be satisfied with this. Nevertheless, on the third day, on the third day, he rose from the dead to prove the will of God and to show us what real faith looks like. His faith was alive. His faith was true. His faith was not isolated. Nevertheless, nevertheless, his will, his will, his will. Church today, the call is for you to say, God, your will, not mine. I've been doing it my way all these years. I've been doing it my way all these decades. Hasn't been working. Perhaps you need to pray the prayer of Jesus. Nevertheless, I don't feel like it. My heart is not in it. I feel like quitting. That he won't stop talking about me. Nobody supports me. Nobody is ever there for me. Nevertheless, despite all of these challenges, perhaps your prayer today ought to be, not my will, but your will, God. Your will, God. I'm going to obey your word. Because if I listen to me, I'm going to isolate myself. And I'm not going to hear any wisdom. Nevertheless, if this is your prayer today, would you stand with me? Not everybody has this prayer. Not everybody has this desire. Not everybody wants to break out of isolation. But if this is your prayer and you're standing with me, you're standing because you believe that you are ready to take your faith to the next level. You're standing because you believe that you're ready to hear God's voice and you're ready to act. You're standing because you believe that God is calling you to the next phase of your faith. If you're standing with me today, you're standing because you believe that what has been done has not been enough. If this is your prayer, stand with me. I want to pray with you. I want to stand in agreement with you. I want to stand here touching and agreeing in the call to the next level of your faith. Hallelujah. Hallelujah. This is your time, church. Hallelujah. This is your time to elevate your faith. Are you going to allow God to call you up? Are you going to take the steps necessary to move closer to God? 
If so, pray with me right now. Father, in the name of Jesus, we denounce isolationist faith. In the name of Jesus, we denounce dead faith. In the name of Jesus, we denounce stagnant faith. Today, as a congregation, Lord, our hearts cry and our desire is that you continue to push us towards a living faith, an active faith, a faith that is alive and well. Our prayer today, Father, is that you push us to take action and to simply do it. Father, some of us talk too much. Would you help us to stop talking? Some of us have a lot of false starts in our history. Father, would you help us get off the starting blocks and to move forward? Father, some of us have a comparative spirit. We compare ourselves to other people and we think we're not running fast enough. We think we don't have the stamina. But Father, would you give us, would you give us a focus on the faith that you have for us? Father, would you bless us to not be dead, but to be alive, to be focused on what you called us to do? We pray this because we believe that there's another level to this and we won't stop until we reach it. We pray these blessings in Jesus' name. Amen. You may have your seats. Hallelujah. Is there anyone in the house who has not accepted Jesus as their Savior, but you feel convicted today to make your faith real and to make your faith sure? If this is you, would you please stand with me or raise your hand and say, I want to accept Jesus as my Savior. Hallelujah. Hallelujah. Church, I pray you are blessed by this word today. We are a tithing, believing church. We believe in tithing. We believe in the offering. Why is that? Because it is a symbol of our faith. It is a form of active faith. Preacher, the meal was good, but I'm just not gonna, not gonna pay you for it. <laughs> Imagine going to the restaurant, racking up a couple hundred dollar bills and, and saying, eh, it was great, but I'm not gonna pay my bill. God has been too good to you. This is not about paying the preacher. This don't even come to me. Your tithe is a gift to God. It is saying to God, I thank you for what you've blessed me with. And I'm not just saying it out of my mouth, but I'm proving it by my actions. My faith is alive as a result of my belief in you. If you're ready to give church, would you stand with me? I know I got y'all exercising today. I'm a young preacher. Blame it on the young legs. But if you're ready to give, join me today in your giving. And I believe you. You want to sing this song? All right, we're going to ask Sister Marva, Deaconess Marva, come up. Bring your offering, bring your tithe to the storehouse as she, Deaconess Harris, gets the basket. As you're walking up, give in faith on the back of your program if you prefer to give via Cash App. Give to the church's Cash App at SBNBCT Cash App. Amen.
for these seeds we have not yet cast a vision for this church that is coming but I need you to understand that these seeds are truly seeds for where God has taken us our prayer is that we not only be givers but that we be cheerful givers in order for you to be a cheerful giver God has to be good to you and I'm looking at a bunch of folk in here who seems like God has been really good to you y'all are quiet has God been good to you? Thank you, Deacon Jones. I appreciate that. God has been good to us. And because of his faithfulness, we want to repay his faithfulness. God, we thank you for these gifts. We thank you for the sacrifice of your people. Father, I thank you for the call upon me and my family to lead in giving, to set the tone for this church. Father, we want to do great things together. We don't want isolationist faith, Father. We want our faith banded together. We want our seeds banded together to do awesome things that will bring you glory and honor. Father, we do ask that you return these gifts 30, 60, 100 fold to your children. Do great things in their lives and build their faith. We pray these blessings in Jesus' name. This is the day that the Lord has made. We will rejoice and be glad in it. Amen. Many of uh, the saints have been here since 930, giving God glory in the learning of his word. We praise God and we have given our mourning to God. So as we continue on, we want to go with the joy of this song. This is the day the Lord has made. We're going to keep that carried in our hearts. Give him glory. Amen. Let's clap and give God glory.
into our announcements for this week. Uh, church, I appreciate y'all. I love y'all. Um, it's John Skinny Jr. up front, please, as we go through this. Um, thank you uh, for being a part of this journey today for those that have come here for our second Sunday. Those who are streaming, we love you. We appreciate you. A couple of things to keep in mind. Please pay attention to all the announcements within your program. Uh, Mother Clements, can you raise your hand, please? Yeah, you beautiful. You. Beautiful. There you go. There you go. There you go. All right. Mother Clements, when you leave today, please stop by to see Mother Clements. She has member applications. If you haven't done so already, we have paper copies. Just please fill it out. It's three pages long. That's it. We're just trying to get to know you. I know it's a lot, uh, but I'm the new guy. I'm the new guy. But we got time. Uh, something y'all didn't tell me. Um, I, I was talking to Reverend Jones for like two seconds last week, and then I turned around, and all y'all were gone. So today, I'm going to catch all y'all. <laughs> That's why he's here. <laughs> so he can pray while I go to the back. Um, but please, before you jet out, I know it's uh, late, but please, before you jet out, please complete the application. It's just for me and my wife to know you. Uh, we also have going to have a brief meet and greet in the back. We got some treats for you, coffee, tea, and some snacks. Please stop by, grab something, say hello, talk with me a little bit. Uh, before you leave out today. Uh, Monday, tomorrow, we have prayer, 7 p.m. If you need prayer, if you need to be touched and agreed upon, if you need some life breathed into your faith, join us tomorrow. Uh, if you don't have, uh, if you're not on the church's text messaging system, I want to encourage you to pull out your phone and join us um, by clicking on the screen at some point when it comes back. It's also on the back of the program, so please get on the text messaging system Wednesday. Wednesday, Wednesday, we have Bible study and prayer again. I will be leading Bible study, uh, but we want you to be a part of prayer as well. This is the Lord's house, and it is a house of prayer. You can never pray too much. Um, I'm noticing that Sister Marva is helping one of our seniors. Uh, it's virtual. On the back of the program, you can scan it in on the screen. I thought it was up there, which is not. Um, you can go ahead and be a part of that. So, um, back of the program, you can use your camera to use the QR code to get on there. Marva is helping Deaconess Harris. If you need help, please see Marva or myself. We'll punch in the phone number, the Zoom link for you. We'll help you out there. Uh, join us next Sunday, 930 for Sunday school and 11 a.m. for service. Bring somebody. Bring somebody. I will keep you here for another half hour if I need to. <laughs> Bring somebody. Amen, somebody. Amen. Now that you said amen, you got to prove it by doing it. Uh, Y'all quiet again. You got to prove it because you said amen. Bring somebody. Invite somebody to be a part of our service next Sunday. Uh, we got Resurrection Sunday in two weeks. That's a great time to bring somebody. We're going to have a rehearsal for a Resurrection Sunday. Uh, if you're going to be a part of that, you will get a message from me today. So look out for your text messages uh, to get that invitation to practice for our worship coming up. Also, if you want to be a part of a Sight and Sound in Pennsylvania to go see that show, please text the church. And you can text the church by utilizing the QR code in the back by saying, I want to go to Daniel and I want the information, we will send it out to you automatically. Amen? Amen. Y'all are quiet. Amen. All right. All right. Now we're going to do something that we used to do in our home church back in the day, which is a closing song. 
Then we're going to have uh, Minister Johnson pray us out. And I'm going to beat y'all in the back so I can trap y'all before y'all leave. Amen. <laughs> Praise God. Father, Son, and Holy Ghost. We thank you today, O oh God, for this wonderful worship experience, O oh God. We thank you for your anointed shepherd, Lord, who have sent to proclaim your word, O oh God. We thank you for that word, O oh God. Lord, we pray that what we've heard, O oh God, will touch our hearts, O oh God, give us conviction, O oh God, and renew our minds, O oh God. Give us strength, O oh God, to do thy will and not our will, O oh God. Let your will be done, Father. Watch over us, O oh Lord, as we adventure into this world, O oh God. Shepherd us, O oh God, from the things that would draw us away from you. Keep us, O oh God, that we will be the sheep of your pastor, O oh God. Watch over us next week, Father God. As we go about doing various things, oh God, we need you. And oh Lord, I pray, oh God, that you will watch over your children. Be that light, oh God, that we need in this dark world. Let your word be a lamp into our path, oh God. May your praises continually be in our mouth, oh God. But please help us to be a doer and not just a hearer, oh God. Transform us into the image of thy son. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen and amen.